In this video, we're talking about restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome is a misunderstood condition. A lot of people don't take it seriously. They might not even think it's a real condition, but it can be debilitating for people. So let's take a look at what it is and how it's treated. If you are a doctor or healthcare professional who wants to up-level your knowledge about sleep medicine, then go ahead and subscribe to this channel. I'm Dr. Nishi Bhopal. I'm a physician specializing in integrative psychiatry and sleep medicine. Every video is eligible for free CMEs. And a quick note for doctors, before we jump into the video, go ahead and grab my free sleep mini course for outpatient physicians. It's jam packed with high yield tools that you can use in your outpatient practice today. So you can go ahead and grab the course uh, using the link shown on the screen here. You can go to intrabalance.com forward slash doctors. This is part one in a two part series on sleep related movement disorders. So stay tuned for the next video on periodic limb movement disorder. But today we're talking about restless leg syndrome. What is restless leg syndrome? Well, it is also known as Willis-Eckbaum disease and it's a sensory motor disorder. It's characterized by an uncontrollable urge to move the legs at rest. It can also affect the arms as well. And it typically happens in the evening, usually when the person's at rest and it usually happens like clockwork. There is a bit of a circadian pattern to it. Now, the thing with restless leg syndrome is that it is a disorder of wakefulness. Even though it's classified as a sleep disorder, it happens when people are awake versus periodic limb movement disorder, which we'll talk about next week, which happens during sleep. So RLS is a disorder of wakefulness. What that means is you don't need a sleep study to diagnose it. One of the other features of restless leg syndrome is that it's temporarily alleviated by movement. So what's the big deal about this anyway? Okay, so you have this urge to move, it's kind of uncomfortable. Is it really that bad? Well, it can actually be debilitating, as I said earlier. It can contribute to sleep onset insomnia. It can also lead to nocturnal awakenings, uh, so waking up during the night. It also is associated with a higher rate of anxiety and depression. And because of these sleep disturbances, it leads to increased rates of daytime sleepiness, which then has an impact on the quality of life. And here's something that's really important, especially if you're a psychiatrist or a therapist, is to recognize that people who have RLS are at a higher risk of suicide. People with RLS are also at a higher risk of having cardiovascular disease. So just imagine if you're somebody who has RLS. You're lying down on the couch because you want to relax in the evening and maybe watch a movie, or you're ready for bed and you're getting cozy and comfortable, and then you just can't get comfortable. You have this urge to move, you just can't get into the right position, and you just have this feeling like you're jumping out of your skin. And that sensation is really deep. It's not like the surface level kind of like itch or just a bit of a discomfort. It's like this deep internal feeling where people have this urge to move. It might feel like a pulling sensation. It might feel like a cramping or a creeping sensation, almost like creepy crawlies. It could feel like this deep discomfort or soreness. So as you can tell, it's deeply disturbing for people and it really affects their ability to relax and sleep and get comfortable. So who gets RLS? Well, it's pretty common in population studies of people of European descent. It affects about five to 15% of that population. But if you include people of non-European descent, overall, maybe about two to 3% of the population experiences this. It's less common in, non in people of non-European background. It's also more common in women, and it's more common in older adults. Okay, so what causes it? Well, there is thought to be a genetic component, and one of the consistent findings in people who have RLS is reduced levels of, of central nervous system iron. So this is reflected in low ferritin levels that you can check in the blood. You also get downregulation of striatal dopamine receptors, and remember that iron is important as a cofactor in dopamine synthesis. There's also some studies showing that increased cerebral glutamate and decreased cerebral adenosine may also play a role. Certain medical conditions are also associated with an increased risk of RLS. Uh, this includes kidney disease, neurological issues like spinal cord disease or Parkinson's and MS. Pregnancy is also a risk factor. And then certain medications can cause it as well. So things like antihistamines, antidepressants, and dopamine antagonists as well. So those are things like antipsychotics or antiemetics. If information like this is helpful for you, then go ahead and click the like button. Okay, how do you work up RLS? The RLS Syndrome Foundation came up with new treatment guidelines in 2021. And there are three main things. One is to check iron status. Two is to rule out other conditions like sleep apnea that could be contributing. 
And then the third thing is to assess the role of any medications the person may be taking in contributing to the symptoms. So let's look at how to properly check iron. Now the RLS guidelines are announcing that iron therapy can be beneficial even in people who don't have anemia. Now the full iron assessment should be done, so not just ferritin in isolation. So the full assessment includes serum iron, ferritin, TIBC, and transferrin saturation. These levels should be checked early in the morning after an overnight fast. So, so the guidelines are recommending that these levels should be done fasting. You want to hold supplements for at least about 48 hours before the test. It's recommended that people who have a serum ferritin of less than 75 milligrams per liter or a transferrin saturation of 45% or less should receive oral iron therapy. Then for people who have poor absorption or more severe symptoms, IV iron therapy may be considered. So as you can surmise, the treatments include replacement of iron. And sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes simply giving somebody an iron supplement can help alleviate the symptoms. And I see this a lot in my practice. Behavioral strategies are helpful as well. So this includes getting enough exercise, avoiding caffeine and alcohol and other sleep disruptors. Even doing a warm soak or a compression or massage can be helpful as well. You want to minimize any exacerbating medications and also treat any underlying medical conditions or sleep disorders that could be contributing. And then in certain cases, medications may be considered to treat RLS. So these are typically things like dopamine agonists, but look out for augmentation and also impulse control issues. Pregabalin or gabapentin may be considered. Sometimes benzodiazepines may be considered like clonazepam. That's more for mild intermittent symptoms. And then in more severe cases, opioids may actually be considered. So there's a long way to go with research and really understanding how to treat RLS more effectively to get long-term relief without using medications, especially for people who don't respond to, uh, to replacement with iron. There may be a role for things like cannabis or Botox or even other supplements. Things like magnesium might be helpful, but again, more studies are needed to understand this. And one last point there is that vitamin D supplementation may also be helpful. There are some studies emerging on the role of vitamin D in RLS. Do you ever see patients with RLS? What helps your patients? Or if you struggle with it, what has helped you? Go ahead and let us know in the comments below.